Welcome to KJV Home Bible Study. This is JC Legar coming to you live from the Man Cave. We're going to be doing our final study on the doctrine of the deity of Christ. I hope you've been enjoying the lesson. We've studied on how Jesus has fulfilled Old Testament prophecies about himself. We've studied how Jesus He's omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and immutable. We've studied how Jesus Christ is a creator, how he is the Savior, and how Jesus allowed and received worship, and how Jesus Christ is also the great I Am. Now, today we're going to be studying how four of the apostles what they had to say on the deity of Christ. But before we do anything, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Jesus, Father, thank you for this time in your word, Lord. We just pray that the Holy Spirit would fill me, enable me, Lord, to teach your word in a way that is clear and everybody can understand it and receive from it what it has to teach about who you are. Lord, bless this time now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. All right. So let us study page one. This is from the Apostle Paul. All right. For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated from and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Wow. Again, that is the Apostle Paul. For in him dwelleth all fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's Colossians 2 9. So Jesus could say, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because Jesus had the Holy Spirit in him, he had God the Father, and he was the visible manifestation of the invisible God. So again, if you want to see who God is, look at Jesus. All right, let's continue with our study. Hold on one second. All right. All right, just going to be... All right, let's continue. Again, this is the Apostle Paul. He used to be Saul of Tarsus, a man who hated Christians and persecuted them. And then God knocked him off his horse and blinded him for three days and turned him into the Apostle Paul. And here's what he had to say on the deity of Christ. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. That is 1 Timothy 3.16. Now again, other Bibles, they are perversions of the Word of God, and they want to take out the word God was manifest in the flesh. And you know what they say? He was manifest in a body. What the heck does that mean? I'm manifest in a body, but in the King James you say, God was manifest in the flesh. That's very clear. And in Romans 9.5 it says, Whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is over all? God blessed forever. Amen. Again, uh, when I was studying this verse, I was looking at God was manifest in the flesh, but after it said justified in the spirit. And I was like, just confused, like, what does that mean? And 
I prayed about it and God revealed to me something interesting. Remember when Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness? He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and then Satan came to him and tempted him. And it is recorded in Matthew and also in Luke what Jesus endured during those 40 days. Now, my question is, who was there to witness this, to write it down? Answer, nobody but the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit spoke to Matthew and Luke and told them what to write. But the thing is, the Holy Spirit witnessed Jesus successfully rebuking the devil. Every time the devil say, hey, turn this stone into bread, Jesus rebuked him with the word of God. He said, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. And when the devil took him to the tower, told him, throw yourself down, it is written, the angels shall, you know, carry you and you won't dash your feet on a stone. Again, Jesus rebuked him with the word. He said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then finally, Jesus, you know, the devil offered him the whole world. He goes, everything is mine and I'll give it to you if you worship me. And Jesus rebuked him with the word again. He said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and only him will you serve. So again, nobody was there to witness this encounter with the devil, but the Holy Spirit, he was there to witness it. And he saw Jesus being successful, so he was justified in the Spirit. That's what God gave me. And again, uh, if you want to receive that as something that can go with this, and cool, if, you know, but again, that's what God gave me. So there you go. All right, let me do one thing real quick. And we'll continue. All right. In Titus 2, 11 through 13, it says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2, 11 through 13. Again, this is written by the Apostle Paul, and it calls Jesus the great God and our Savior. Now, if you remember that teaching I did a few weeks ago, God four times in the Old Testament said, I am the only Savior, and besides me, there is no God. And here in Titus 2.13, you got Paul calling Jesus the Savior and the great God. So these verses, I don't know, I think they're pretty much self-explanatory. All right, it's always when you want to do something on a computer that it wants to act up. All right. Okay, in Philippians 2, 5 through 11, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, and things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Again, this is Philippians 2, 5-11, by the Apostle Paul. 
So here God is expecting everyone to bow the knee and to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know where you come from, but where I come from, that is called worship. And if God commands us to worship and he will share his glory with no one, Jesus Christ is God. All right, so uh, as a teacher of Kit Church, the Apostle Paul wrote something that here I'm to take very personally and to be on the lookout for. So let's check out this verse. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Again, the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Very clear to me. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Wolves that look like this guy right here. Scary looking wolf. You Alright. <laughs> also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn every one night and day with tears. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Again, this is by the Apostle Paul. See, the word of his grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Meaning, you can never earn or deserve to be loved by God, let alone to be saved. It is his good will to save those who believe. And the reason it's a free gift is because God did all the work. He doesn't want to share his glory with anyone. See, if you had to jump out of a plane, you'd have a parachute on, hopefully. And when you jump out, are you flapping your arms trying to help? No. What you do is you pull the cord, the parachute pops out, and even though you're breaking the law of gravity, you're not going to go splat. And in the same way, we broke God's laws, all Ten Commandments. We have... You know, we've broken him. But because of what Christ did on the cross, he's our parachute. And when we pull on the faith cord and believe on him, he pops out and he brings us in for a safe landing. And because of him, we'll survive the effect of gravity, which is the judgment for our sin. Let's continue. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints and light, who has delivered us from the power of darkness, and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Apostle Paul, Colossians 1, 12 through 17. So again, God is being very clear here on who Jesus is. He's not just some guy born in the Middle East who lived a good life and sadly 
died a martyr's death. No, he was God in the flesh who came to the earth, fully God, fully man, lived a perfect life, took your sins upon himself, went to the cross, paid the death penalty for them. And on the third day, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rose him from the dead, and now he offers you eternal life if you will simply believe on him. It's that simple, guys. So let's continue. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Ephesians 3.9 Do you want to know what the mystery is? Huh? Do you? Do you? Huh? Do you? I'll tell it to you. The mystery is that God wants to live in you. The hope of glory is Christ in you. Think about that. God doesn't want to dwell in a temple. He wants to dwell in your body, which is the temple of God. How cool is that? All right, so we've looked at the Apostle Paul. Now we're going to look at what Stephen, the first martyr, had to say while he was being killed. Let's check it out. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So again, they're killing poor Stephen here. He's calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Which is another nice way of saying he died. Acts 7, 39 through 60. Uh, William, it's uh, Acts 7, 59 through 60. Thank you, love. I don't have my glasses on. I got old man vision. <laughs> Next time, wear your glasses. <laughs> I know. It's vanity. It's vanity. That's why I don't want to wear it. Um... <laughs> Uh, I don't know. It's only because Stephen had the Holy Spirit in him that he would pray for those killing him. See, Jesus, when he died on the cross, he also prayed for his enemies. He cried, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And again, when you're being killed by somebody, it's like, wow. You know, of all the times to want to get in the flesh and say, God, get them. No, G Stephen is saying, Lord, don't lay this into their charge. Amazing. And it was probably because of that that Saul of Tarsus, which would later become Paul, was so moved. He probably never forgot this. Let's continue. Now we're going to see what Thomas, another apostle, had to say. And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the door, or doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither my, thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. John 20, 26 through 29. It's, uh, 20, oh yeah, he had it right. <laughs> I got it right that time. Ha! <laughs> All right, so here is a perfect time for Jesus to set the record straight. If Thomas, looking up into the eyes of Jesus, looking at the wounds, and calling him my Lord and my God, if Jesus was not Lord God Almighty, he should have rebuked Thomas, saying, hey, don't call me that, there's only one God. But no, he received that 
declaration. He received that worship that Thomas was giving. So again, if he's not God, then we have a big problem then, huh? All right, so here is what John, another apostle, had to say on the deity of Christ. And this verse is one of the most hated verses in the Bible by the devil. The devil hates this doctrine here. (laughs) For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 1 John 5, 7. Every perversion of the Bible takes this verse out. They don't want to have anything to do with it because that is one of the greatest verses that deals with the Trinity, which I will be teaching on next week, by the way. Okay, in the beginning, which is time, you got the past, present, and future. God created the heaven which is space, length, breadth, and height, and the earth, which is matter, which is solid, liquid, and gas. That's in the first verse in the book of Genesis, Genesis 1.1. Now, there are different ways to look at the Trinity, which are not in the Bible, but they're pretty cool. In one family, you have a husband, a wife, and a child. The three are one family. That's cool. In America, I love this, you got the 48 states which are on the continent, and then you got Hawaii and Alaska, the three are one country. Isn't that cool? Alright, then you got uh, an atom, you got a neutron, protron, electron, and again with water you got liquid, solid, which is ice, and then steam. Like gas. Yeah, gas. But, you know, again, uh, we're going to study this doctrine of the Trinity. Because when's the last time that you heard a sermon on the Trinity in a Christian church? I'm waiting. (laughs) You never, ever hear about the Trinity. It's like, come on, people. We need to be taught the Word of God here. So, hopefully... You'll tune in next week, and I'll be teaching on it, and you'll be blessed. All right. John continues here. And we know that the Son of God is come, and has given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. John 5, 20 through 21. I need water. I'm dying. Uh, the word of God chokes me up. <laughs> uh, much better. Again, John is very clear. He's calling Jesus Christ the true God. I love these verses. Me too. All right. And we're going to end it again with what John had to say. Everybody knows John 3.16. Quote it for me, Chloe. John 3.16. For God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes his own hand should not perish, but have everlasting life. Ding, ding, ding. All right. Now we're going to look at 1 John 3.16. And this is from the King James Bible. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Again, this is 1 John 3.16. Now, the problem is, with other versions, guess what they do? They take out the word God. That is, the New King James does that, and it drives me nuts. Because with this, you got a deity of Christ first. But if you take out God, hereby perceive we the love, because he laid down his life for us. But here it's, hereby perceive we the love of God, because God laid down his life for us. And I want you guys, if... 
you've never seen this, go to, on your computer, it's a free download software, go to King James Pure Bible Search, and I'll show you what this does. It tells you how many times a word is in the King James Bible. Now, if you look here, the word God is 4,444 times in a King James Bible. Now, because the new King James took that word out, that beautiful pattern is taken away. In a King James, God is 4,444 times. Do you think that's just some random coincidence that a perfect number like that? And again, if you're of the persuasion that the King James is a good version, but there are no perfect translations, all of them have errors, I got a problem with that. Because if the Word of God is not perfect and preserved by God, if God can't keep His Word saved, how is He going to keep a sinner like me saved? If there's one error in a King James Bible, then I'm in big trouble. Because if God can't keep His Word preserved, He can't keep me saved. Because I'm too good of a sinner. So again, I'm trusting that God has the power to preserve His Word, not just in the original manuscripts, but in today's King James Bible. Guys, this has been JC Ligar. I pray you were blessed. Again, it's a free download. King James Pure Bible Search. If you want something fun to play with, like I said, uh, if you type in the word Son of Man, it's 196 times, and then the name Jesus Christ, 196 times too. What that number means, I have no idea, but those two titles having the same amount only in the King James Bible, baby. All right, so again, this is JC Ligar. Join me next week. I will be teaching on the Trinity. It'll be a really good time in the Word, and I pray you'll be blessed by it. So this is JC Ligar. I pray you were blessed. God bless you guys.